Are you familiar with the basics of evolutionary theory? Then you might know that the fossil record actually puts evolution in real trouble. You might also know that various theories have been put forward by Darwin's advocates in an attempt to fix that problem. In this video, I'm going to show you why these attempts not only fail, but even amplify the Darwinian dilemma. So this should be interesting. Hi, my name is Lucas and this is my channel Deflate, which challenges skeptics, strengthens believers and creates a space for awesome discussions about God. This is my second video in my ongoing series on intelligent design. In the previous episode, I talked about how Darwin was painstakingly aware of the fact that his theory was diametrically opposed to the fossil record, which, then as now, shows that new animal forms show up suddenly and without any intermediate forms preceding them. Darwin was hoping that as paleontology would progress, later discoveries would produce those forms and vindicate his theory. Yet the exact opposite happened. Paleontologists have found even more evidence of new animal forms suddenly appearing for the first time out of the blue, as it were, in the era called the Cambrian, without any precursory forms in the preceding geological era. This phenomenon is called the Cambrian explosion, and it completely defies the Darwinian idea of gradual change over time. Check out my first video to get a better idea of the details. Now, in this video, I'm going to walk you through three of the most important theories that have been proposed in the attempt to plug the hole. And what you'll get to see at the end is that these theories not only don't close that gap, but actually widen it significantly. So stay with me. Let's get started. Historically, one of the first hypotheses to be proposed held that intermediate forms to the Cambrian animals must exist somewhere in the fossil record of the Precambrian. This so-called artifact hypothesis claimed, however, that the Precambrian layers were buried at the bottom of the ocean or under the bottom of the ocean due to the rising and falling of ancient sea levels. Just like Darwin, who suggested that the missing fossils would be found in the future, this was basically a scientific theory of the gaps, which did nothing to explain the known evidence as it presents itself to us. Instead, it explained away the absence of paleontological evidence for Darwinian evolution. Be that as it may, this theory didn't survive for very long anyway. In the 1940s, oil companies got into offshore drilling and started to work their way through miles of seafloor sediments. However, as geologists examined the drill course, the supposed Precambrian fossils were nowhere to be found, and so the fate of the artifact hypothesis was sealed. In response to its initial defeat, the artifact hypothesis was then adapted to propose that the intermediate animal forms of the Precambrian, which supposedly led to the Cambrian animals, must have been too small or too soft or both to have been preserved. However, in the 1980s, spectacular paleontological finds at the site in China called the Maoshen Shan Shales were unearthed from Precambrian sediments. They revealed a wide range of soft-bodied animals which were preserved with astonishing accuracy. Besides discovering fossilized jellyfish or stomachs, digestive glands and nerve rings of various animals, paleontologists also found fossilized sponges. Now, you need to understand that the anatomical structure of sponges is extremely delicate, which is why they have been called nature's glasswork. Still, there is more. Because paleontologists didn't just discover sponge organisms themselves in China, but they were even able to identify sponge embryos in their early stage of cell division. Not only that, but these sponges were preserved with such fidelity that biologists could even identify the nuclei of fossilized embryonic sponge cells. What all of this means is that sedimentary rocks of the Precambrian were, in fact, perfectly capable of preserving the most delicate organisms. The Darwinist argument that the ancestors of the Cambrian animals must have existed but cannot be recovered due to their softness and smallness is therefore not plausible. That's why another hypothesis was proposed, one that took a radically different approach by claiming that the Precambrian ancestors to the Cambrian animals are actually there in the fossil record, in front of our very eyes, so to speak. This hypothesis refers to fossils of what is called the Vendian fauna, or the Ediacaran fauna, or the fauna of the Ediacaran era. The geological era of the Ediacaran is situated within the Precambrian era. 
forming its last part in fact, at the very interface to the Cambrian era in which the sudden explosion of animal forms takes place. The name of this geological era derives from the Ediacaran Hills in southeastern Australia, where the most significant find of fossils from this time was made. Ediacaran fossils can be put into four different categories. First, the sponges, which we've just mentioned a minute ago. Second, fossils that represent a primitive form of mollusks. Mollusks are invertebrate animals that are partly or wholly enclosed in a shell. The primitive mollusk of the Ediacaran that has been found is called Kimberella, a simple animal form that had a shell similar to that of limpets, one that was strong though not hard. Kimberella crept along the seafloor. Third, so-called trace fossils, which aren't fossilized animals, but rather fossilized remains that are believed to go back to animal activity. Typical trace fossils are, for example, barrows, tracks or fecal pellets attributed to ancient types of worms. The fourth group is made up of the distinctive fossils that were specifically found in the Australian hills and which gave this era its name. These are fossils of mostly soft-bodied organisms, which are large enough to be seen with the naked eye. The three most well-known forms are Dickinsonia, Sprigina and Charnia. The hypothesis we're now considering claims that, taken all together, the Ediacaran fossils of these four categories finally solved the Darwinian problem of the Cambrian explosion. So let's check out how well this holds up. As far as the Ediacaran sponges are concerned, they do indeed bear some resemblance to some of the sponges that appear in the Cambrian era. Similarly, Kimberella can be seen as a precursor to certain Cambrian mollusks. However, it must be pointed out that this relation is problematic for the following reason. While it is true that Kimberella did have strong body parts, it still lacked the hard shell made of calcium carbonate that is distinctive of the film of mollusks. The problem with trace fossils, besides them not being fossils of animals in the first place, is that some of them have actually been shown to represent simple inorganic sedimentary structures or the traces of plant life rather than the result of animal activity. In addition, the dating of some of these trace fossils puts them into the time period of 1.5 to 1.8 billion years ago, which is way before multicellular life even existed in the first place. Nevertheless, for reasons I won't elaborate on here, based on an overly optimistic interpretation of the trace fossil evidence, one may grant that these traces might stem from two different types of animals. However, even with this admission, it is still impossible to define most of the anatomical characteristics of the two animals which are being granted in principle. So how about the fourth group, Dickinsonia, Sprigina and Charnia? the most prominent representatives of the Ediacaran era, which were found in that key site in Australia. Could they plausibly serve as precursors to the Cambrian animals? The problem is that establishing a relationship between these three organisms and the Cambrian animals is virtually impossible, and here is why. Dickinsonia, Sprigina and Charnia have neither obvious head, mouth or gut, nor sense organs such as eyes. They don't even have a body marked by bilateral symmetry. Yet, the animals showing up in the Cambrian explosion exhibit all of these pretty fundamental anatomical features. In addition, given the nature of those ediacaran organisms, scientists have had a very hard time settling on how to classify them, moving them from one taxonomic class to the next and back again. But if these Precambrian organisms can't even be properly classified themselves, the argument that they serve as the precursors to some Cambrian class of animals can never get off the ground, not even in principle. The difficulty of classifying these organisms is due to the fact that they don't qualify, or at least not unequivocally so, as actual animals, since they lack those fundamental animal features that we just mentioned. That's why the magazine Nature noted that if the Ediacaran fauna were animals, they bore little or no resemblance to any other creatures, either fossil or extant. Others have called these organisms representatives of a new kingdom entirely separate from the animals. Therefore, the most notable organisms of the Ediacaran from the Australian hills are off the table as possible precursors of the Cambrian animals. So where does this leave the Darwinian attempt to explain the Cambrian explosion of animal forms by resorting to the Ediacaran fauna? 
Well, in a best case scenario, we have a total of four Precambrian animals which could serve as the intermediates for the Cambrian ones. The sponges and Kimberella are two of them. The other two are the unidentifiable animals which supposedly caused trace fossils. But incorporating them in the hypothesis comes with a heavy load of optimism. Yet, even such an overly hopeful best-case scenario, featuring four Precambrian precursors to the Cambrian animals, does literally nothing to solve the problem of the Cambrian explosion. And here is why. Recall from my first video that a wide variety of animals representing as many as 20 different phyla pop up suddenly in the Cambrian era. The phyla, as you may remember from that video, constitute the highest or widest categories of biological classification in the animal kingdom, with each exhibiting a unique architecture, organizational blueprint or structural body plan. Here are three examples of three different phyla. The phylum of the arthropods includes all insects, all spiders, all types of crabs, lobsters, as well as the trilobites. The phylum of the cnidarians includes corals, jellyfish and sea anemones. And the phylum of the chordates includes, among other animals, all birds, reptiles, fish and mammals. In each of these groups of phyla, all the animals, as different as they may look from each other, are united by their organizational structure, which is also the very thing that allows us to differentiate between the phyla. The animal kingdom is usually organized into 35 different phyla, and the known fossil record features animals representing about 27 of those 35 phyla. Of the 27 phyla featured in the fossil record, 20 make their first and sudden appearance within one single geological time period called the Cambrian Era. Looking at this number, it should be immediately clear why referencing the Ediacaran fauna does nothing to solve the Darwinian problem of the Cambrian explosion. The most optimistic scenario offers us no more than four possible Ediacaran precursors for the Cambrian animal forms. This means that a total of 16 different phyla are still left utterly unaccounted for. Remember that the 16 unaccounted for animals refer not to animals that are just slightly different from each other, like a cat and a dog for example. No, we're talking about 16 phyla, that is 16 categorically different animal forms, each of which is distinct from the other in the most fundamental ways possible. Don't think cat and dog difference, but humpback whale spider difference. Therefore, what is needed are 16 different precursors for each of the 16 phyla, which are still unaccounted for in the optimistic Ediacaran best case scenario. 16 out of 20 are 80%, and if a hypothesis fails to explain 80% of the data, it's probably not a great hypothesis. And it gets far worse still for the following reason. You have to understand that the Ediacaran era is the very first era in the history of our planet in which multicellular life appears. Before the time of the Ediacaran, the only organisms that inhabited planet Earth for a total of about 3 billion years ever since life began were exclusively single-celled. Then, in the Ediacaran period, which spans no longer than 15 million years, the first sponges, the mollusk-like Kimberella and other multicellular creatures like Dickinsonia, Sprigina and Charnia show up on the scene, suddenly and abruptly, without any evidence whatsoever of a gradual change from single-celled life to these new multicellular organisms. This is why the appearance of the Ediacaran fauna is actually referred to by paleontologists as another instance of biological life exploding into all sorts of different forms, just as it does in the Cambrian era. Sure, the Ediacaran explosion is far smaller than the Cambrian one, as the variety and complexity of the Ediacaran organisms doesn't come close to those of the Cambrian animals. However, when comparing the Ediacaran fauna not to the Cambrian fauna which it precedes, but to the single-celled organisms which it succeeds, the Ediacaran fauna actually represents what has been called a quantum leap in organismal and ecological complexity. Another way to put it is that biology's Big Bang, as the Cambrian explosion is sometimes called, is preceded by a biological POW. Thus, referring to the Ediacaran fauna doesn't just not heal the Achilles heel of Darwin's theory that is known as the Cambrian explosion. Instead, it exposes that there are actually two such heels, the Cambrian and the Ediacaran explosion, both of which utterly defy the Darwinian idea that species evolve gradually from one form into the next. 
Check out this episode to learn more about the basics of intelligent design and critical thinking about evolutionary theory. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you guys for watching and see you over here.